We are FBC Summit, leading everyday people to love Jesus and make Him known. Thank you so much for joining us today. Here's our pastor, Dr. Larry LeBlanc. I am so glad that you are here today. We are in the third part uh, of an eight-week series that we have embarked upon on defending the faith, an apologetic series. Uh, over the past couple of weeks, we have spent them talking about the existence of God. We talked about two weeks ago the philosophical reasons for the existence of God, and we looked at what is called the moral argument. And last week, we looked at the reason for the existence of God from a scientific perspective. And we looked at the teleological argument, or the argument from design. But today, what we will bring up is the most personal of all of the issues that we are going to deal with in this entire series. In fact, we will spend both this week and next week on this subject. And the reason that we're going to spend so much time there is that if you were to poll the world and ask them why they had reservations about belief in God. It would not be uh, the moral argument that they would bring up. It wouldn't even be the teleological argument that they would bring up. It would be what is known as the problem of evil. Now, even if you've never used that term, the problem of evil, you are familiar with this argument because even those of you in here who are the most committed Christians and believers have struggled with this question at some point. Every one of us who are people of faith have experienced the wonderment about the argument that is posed by so many people when they look out at the world and they see the evil that is so ever-present in our world, when they see the pain that is everywhere in our world, when they see the suffering that takes place. It leads some people to what we're going to show today is actually an illogical conclusion, and the argument goes something like this, and there are different forms of this argument, but the argument goes something like this. If God is all good, He would defeat evil. If God is all powerful, He would defeat evil. But obviously, evil is not defeated. Pain and suffering still exist. So therefore, there must not be a God. The argument continues then that if there is a God somewhere, he is either not all good or he is not all powerful. But because if he was both, then we wouldn't see the pain, we wouldn't see the heartache, we wouldn't see the problems we see in our world. Sometimes we experience these feelings collectively as a culture when we see things like 9-11, when we experience global pandemics. But for most people, where the problem of evil hits home is when suffering and pain enters your life. And when suffering and pain enters your family, and you find yourself asking the question, if God loves me, why am I walking through this? If God is so good, then why am I hurting so bad? If God can do something about it, because the Bible says that He is almighty and all-powerful, then why doesn't God do something about it? There is not a soul listening this morning that has not at some point in their darkest hours found themselves there. Maybe even in honesty with God in prayer and beseeching God's throne about the very issues that we're taking up. So what I want to tell you today is that as we embark on this journey together over the, ne over the next two weeks, we are not looking at simply philosophical questions. We're not looking at just questions that might come out of a philosophy of religion textbook. But we're looking at questions that affect us as a society, and we're looking at questions that affect you and I individually in our everyday life. Yet we know that verses like Romans 8.28 that say that all things work together for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. We know that the Bible tells us unequivocally that God is good, that He is holy, holy, holy. We know that hundreds of times in the Bible that the omnipotence of God is referred to. Most often it is He is referred to as Almighty throughout Scripture. And so we know that the Bible teaches that He is pure, that He is righteous, that He is holy, so therefore He is good. But we also know that the Bible teaches that He is omnipotent or all-powerful. So we find ourselves asking the question, how do God's omnipotence and how does God's holiness 
fit in when we see a world that seems ransacked by evil, ransacked by pain, ransacked by suffering? How does Romans 8, 28, for we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him and who are called according to His purpose. How does Romans 8, 28 fit into the problem of evil and suffering? And that is what we're going to walk through today. I've placed more notes on the screen the past few weeks than I normally place on the screen. Um, We're asking a big question over the next several weeks, and what we'll do is try to answer those big questions with big answers. And so the first answer I would give you as we address this question is that the question itself gives an answer. The question itself gives an answer. And you say, okay, Larry, I guess you're going to play word games in trying to answer this. Just think with me for a moment. If I was to ask the question, why, do evil ex- why does evil exist? Why does pain exist? Why does suffering exist? It presupposes something. It presupposes that I know what good is. Because if I don't know what good is, how can I know what evil is? If I don't know what good or what right is supposed to be, then how can I know what pain and suffering look like? So the question itself actually proves the existence of God. Let let me give you just a a, a basic way to understand this. If we cut off all the lights in here and we covered the windows, every one of you in here would be able to look out and you would be able to say, it's dark in here. If we were to cut air conditioners and freezers on and we brought the temperature in here to 20 degrees Fahrenheit... Every one of you in here would be able to say it's cold or you would say it's freezing. So I ask you the question, how would you know it was dark in here or how would you know it was cold in here? The only reason that you would know it was dark in here is because you know what light looks like. You know what it is to be in the light, so you know what the converse is. The only reason that you know what cold feels like is because you know what warmth and you know what heat feels like. The only reason that you and I rationally in our conscience are even able to pose the question of the existence of God in the presence of evil and suffering is that intrinsically inside of us we know what good is and we know what evil is. We know what things would be like if there were no pain and what things would be like if there was no suffering and the fact that you even have the capacity to frame that in your mind is proof of the goodness of God it shows that God has placed a framework in our souls that God did not create the world in its current state but he did create the possibility of evil by giving us something we call freedom which brings us to our second answer If God was to do away with evil, he would have to do away with choice and freedom. If God was to do away with evil, he would have to do away with choice and freedom. How could you ever live in a world that evil was not possible and there also not be choice? Right now, every one of you has the capacity to choose. In fact, you have the capacity right now to choose whether or not to even listen to the rest of this message. I don't mean that just you pick up your phone and start doing other things. I mean right now, if you want to, nobody is stopping you. You have the freedom to stand up where you are, walk out in the aisle, walk out of those doors, get in your car, and leave. There is a freedom that is given you, and you make choices. And outside of the possibility of evil, which brings about the possibility of pain and suffering, there would be no free will and there would be no choice. And some of you are saying right now, well, Larry, that sounds like a great world. I I would like to live in that world. Why do we need choice? I think most of you already know the answer to that without me spending a great deal of time on it. But if you want to live in a world without free will and you want to live in a world without choice, then you also want to live in a world without love. Because if I have forced someone to love me or forced someone to make a choice, is that love? Outside of the capacity for free will, outside of the capacity for choice, which leaves open the capacity for evil, it's not even possible. 
But maybe it is right now. You're, you're trying to hang with me, and we're early in the sermon, but you're saying, Larry, it sounds like these first two reasons, these are very theoretical. I mean, the first one, it, it, it almost sounded like you were dancing around the question. And, and then with the second one, it doesn't really seem like that that, that is going to answer the deep, mo, deep-seated deep objection that's in my soul. Well, then maybe number three, which I think may be the strongest argument against this entire question, I think number three may get right at the heart of what we need to be talking about. In fact, I think it's the strongest argument that we're talking about. In fact, it's this. Are we asking the wrong question? Are we asking the wrong question? Let me phrase how the problem of evil is coined by most people in our culture. If you ask them if they believe in God and they say no, the majority of people will get, the reason they will give you that they will say no is it will sound something like this. I don't believe in God because too often I see bad things happen to good people. Many of you ever heard that? I see good people who are suffering and I see good people who have pain in their life and I see good families that are ransacked and I say, and they'll call them random. Random has become the byword in our culture. Everything is random. People describe things as random that aren't random at all. And they'll say, I see these random acts of terrorism or these random acts of evil that are done and I can't see how that would fit because if bad things happen to good people, doesn't that prove that there's not a good and powerful God? I submit to you, church, that we are asking the wrong question. In fact, that may be one of the greatest arguments. If someone was to bring the problem of evil before you and you were going to address it, this would be the one that I might camp out on because I might ask them, do you think that possibly you're asking the wrong question? Which, if I were to ask you that, probably even now you're thinking, well, what's the right question? You see, sometimes it might be our best argument is to refuse to answer the wrong question. Instead, tell people what the right question is. So it's not, why do bad things happen to good people? But here's the right question. Why do good things happen to bad people? Why do good things happen to bad people? Now, what I'm about to say may shock some of you. But biblically, I can back this up, and so I want you to to go with me here. There are no good people. Did you know that? There are no good people. You say, well, I'm offended. I am offended. I am one of the best people I know. And if that was your thought, then you have a problem of pride and you are the chief of sinners. So we've already proved in your life that you're wrong. Right? There are no good people. And so I'd ask another question. What if God was to do away with evil? What if he started with you? What if he started with you? Now people will say, hold on a minute, hold on. If God was going to start removing evil, he would need to start with a whole lot different people than me. If he was going to remove evil, I mean, I may not be perfect, but I mean, come on. I'm not Hitler, I'm not Manson, I mean, there are a lot of people in the world that if he was going to start with, I mean, I am better than them. But when we say we are better, or we say we are good, according to what standard are you good? Yeah, by your standard, you may be better than Charles Manson, I don't doubt that. But according to what standard? Because if we're only going to compare ourselves with Hitler, or Manson, or... Pol Pot or some of the most disgusting rulers over history, Lenin, Stalin, if that's going to be your gauge, then you're using the wrong gauge because that's not the gauge that God uses. What's the gauge that God uses? He's not going to compare you and me. He's not even going to compare you with the most heinous people in all of the world. Who is God going to compare you to? Do you know? Himself. That's who you're compared with is the holiness of God. And we've done this numerous times, and I'm not going to take the time to go through this right now. 
but a quick look at the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, and you read them, and what do you walk away saying? You don't walk away saying like the rich young ruler, oh, I'm a righteous man. You walk away looking at it and saying, I'm evil. I'm evil. So if we're asking the wrong question, not why do bad things happen to good people, but why do good things ever happen to bad people, what we begin to understand is that anything good that's ever happened to you is proof of the grace of God. Now that doesn't mean that everyone who suffers is worse than someone who doesn't. Understand that. The entire book of Job makes that clear. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. John chapter 9 makes that clear when the disciples ask Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents? It doesn't mean that when suffering or evil hits your life that you are necessarily a worse sinner than someone else. But what it does mean is that there is no one who is not deserving of the wrath of God. Natural disasters, birth defects, horrendous things that people walk through. Romans 5.12 says that sin entered through one man and death through sin so that we all deserve death. So, if we wanted God to be fair, because essentially isn't that what the problem of evil is about? We want God to be fair, right? We want good people to be rewarded and bad people to be punished. But if we want God to be fair, We need to be very careful with asking that question. A synonym for fair may be just. Is that that okay? Fairness and justice, wouldn't you say that those are synonymous? So what would be just? What would God be just in doing? Well, Romans 6.23 answers that question. For the wages of sin is death. What is a wage? A wage is what I am due for the way I've lived my life. Well, according to the holiness of God and according to the Ten Commandments, then I am not a good person, so what am I do? I'm due death. So what society ought to be overwhelmed with is not why do bad things happen to good people, but the question should be, why am I even allowed to still be alive? Why have I seen a sunrise? Why have I felt the wind against my face? Why do I know what beauty is? Why have I experienced love? Why hasn't God already killed me? And when we understand what we are due, then all of a sudden it frames everything. Which brings up our fourth point. That just because God hasn't ended evil and suffering, that doesn't mean that He won't. Just because God has not ended evil and suffering yet, that does not mean that He won't. Jesus said, in this life you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus didn't even try to come up with some trite excuse for problems. He told you, even after he would be resurrected, that people were going to have problems, that there would be trouble, that there would be pain, that there would be suffering. This wasn't just for the lost. This was for everyone. And that pain and suffering we know will not be righted completely until his return when he establishes a new heaven and a new earth, Revelation. But yet there are many people that in their critique of God, it would be the same as reading half of a book and then criticizing an author for the way the book ends. Now, I don't know how many of you are in book clubs or have had to do book reviews, but if you're only going to read half a book, then you don't get to critique the ending because you don't understand nor do you know the ending. Yet when we read all of Scripture, when we read the entire Bible, we begin to see that just because everything that we hoped for hasn't happened yet does not mean that it's not going to happen. And by the way, this is just a supplementary point to this argument. The fact that you have hope for something better, where do you think that came from? 
The fact that there's a longing inside of you for things to be made right, for things to be made whole. It's because we were originally created, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, in a place that was completely perfect. And we know deep down in our soul, no one has to convince you that things aren't right. I don't have to spend a ton of time convincing you that there's evil in the world or pain in the world or starvation in the world or famine in the world or that there are heinous people that do heinous things. And many of you know that not just from looking out at the world, but looking at your individual life. And so it does us well to remember that we are not at the end of the story. It simply means that we may not agree with God's timetable. You see, I think there's also the wrong assumption that because God hasn't ended it yet, that He's not doing anything to defeat evil. That's simply not true. He has revealed to us in our hearts and our conscience and through the Word of God what is right and wrong. He equips us with the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ on the cross. And even right now, God the Father knows the very moment when Jesus will return. So what does that tell me? It tells me that even right now, though I can't see or perceive all of the actions of God, that God is working on behalf of His world and He's working on behalf of my life to do those things which are unseen to bring about a world that is perfect, a world that Revelation says will have no more crying and no more weeping and no more pain and no more tears. Which brings us to what I believe is number five, and I believe this maybe just under number three is, is an argument that, that needs to be espoused. And I'm going to phrase this in the form of a question. If God were to one-on-one -on -one explain the problem of evil to you, to you, do you really think you'd understand it? Do you really believe that in your limited mental, spiritual capacity you would understand it? I'll prove to you biblically that you wouldn't understand it because it's happened before. If you want to keep your Bible in Romans 8, 28, you want to flip back and you want to open your Bible to Job verses 38 through 40, let me just tell you kind of how that went. There is an arrogance that exists when we think we can't, because we can't understand something, then it doesn't make sense or there is no point in it. Have you ever tried to teach a child math, some math concept, and they beat their fist and they say, I don't understand this. I'm never going to need this. I'm not going to do this anymore. Well, inherent in the child's argument is that it doesn't make sense because they don't understand it. Because I don't know how to do this. I can't be understood. But yet, adults People like you and I take that same argument into every theological circle. And we say things like, if we can't get it, then it must just not make sense. How arrogant do you have to be to believe that? When you serve an infinite God who Isaiah says his ways are higher than your ways and his thoughts are higher than your thoughts. But Job's friends, and by the way, if you've got friends like Job's, you need to find new friends. They tried to explain to him why he was suffering and what was their answer. They said, the reason you've had all these problems is because you're sorry. That's a Mississippi translation of Job. They said, you're sorry. You're a sinner. God's punishing you because of how you've lived your life. That was their answer, which may be at times an answer. And it may actually be an answer but not in every scenario or circumstance. So Job, throughout this, eventually says, I'd like to have my day in court with God. He asked that three-letter question that all of you have asked at some point in your life. It's a question that your children have asked since they came into this world, and some of them ask it incessantly. And do you know the question I'm talking about now? Why, 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 why? Till eventually you say something as a parent that sounds like this. Have you ever said this? Because I said so. Job 38 through 40 is God saying, because I said so. Because God has not spoken up throughout the book of Job. And all of a sudden, in chapter 38 of Job, it says that the Lord speaks out of the storm. 
And if you haven't read Job yet, you may sit there with bated breath going, oh, he's going to give the perfect answer to the problem of evil. But do you know what God does? He uses the same argument that we used last week. The argument from design. And instead of being questioned... He takes the role of the attorney, the prosecutor. And God says, you've been asking a lot of questions of me, so why don't we flip the tables and I'm going to ask a few questions of you. And in Job chapter 38, he asked the question, who is it that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I'll question you and you answer me. Do you want God to be the one asking you that question? You want to question me? Well, then sit down. I've got some questions myself. Brace yourself like a man. And then God, and I don't have time to walk through every one of the questions, but he asked questions about the earth. And he says in verse 5, who marked off its dimensions? And then do you see what he says next? Surely you know. That's sarcastic. That's God using sarcasm. Who marked off the dimensions of the earth? Well, you're such a genius, and obviously you know everything about everything, and you know the reason for everything that I do, so surely you know how I marked off the earth's dimensions. When I created the world, you know exactly how I did that, so why don't you tell me how that worked? We're already in trouble, and we're just in the first few verses. Verse 12, have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place? Do you make the sun to rise? Do you make the earth to spin on its axis? No, you don't do that either. Have you ever journeyed to the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? You know what's interesting? That even now, in 2020, we've never been to the bottom of the ocean. We still can't answer that question. You haven't even been to the bottom of the ocean. In fact, he's saying, when you can get to the bottom of the ocean and you can explain to me how the ocean was made, then come back and maybe I'll answer your question. God keeps going and he keeps giving example after example. You don't even know when the mountain goats give birth, verse 39, verse 1. Do you even know when the doe bears are fawn? Did you let the wild donkeys go free? Did the hawk take flight by your wisdom? In other words, did you design a bird to be able to fly? And then in verse chapter 40, verse 2, will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? In other words, are you the one who's going to question me? Will you discredit, verse 8, will you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? Over and over again, God begins to show Job and all of his so-called friends that they have no clue what they're talking about. Now, what's so incredibly satisfying about the book of Job is that you may not get the answer that you're looking for, but yet Job, you find out, is satisfied with the answer. Why? Why could Job be satisfied with the answer when so many of us can't be satisfied with the answer? The reason is, is because in the answer, Job encountered God. See, there are a lot of people who are looking for philosophical explanations, but when they encounter the God of the explanation... The place in their life that they've been looking to be filled is found. Job may not have had every answer to every question that he had asked, but he had God himself. And Job began to realize, and what you find out in the book of Job, is that his pain had made a chasm inside his life that only God could fill. And friends, I would tell you, if there was no pain and if there was no evil in the world, There are many of you that would have never learned to long for God and seek for God. But yet you ask, number six, but what could be the purpose in God waiting to rid the world of suffering and rid the world of evil and pain? What would be the purpose in God waiting when He could end it now? Let me ask you what I believe to be a great question. What if he would have ended it before you got saved? Romans 11.25 says that he wants the full number. I don't know what that number is. But he wants the full number to come to him. I don't know all the reasons that Jesus tarries. And I don't pretend to know them all. But I know that one of them is that God wants one more person redeemed. 
that he wants one more person in glory. He wants one more person to experience a universe where there is no more crying or suffering or pain or tears. And God desires that. So his timing is his. And my timing is not perfect. But that leads us to the last of the arguments that we're going to look at this morning. And it's this question. Have you ever learned, grown, or matured through pain and hurt? Have you ever learned, grown, or matured through pain and suffering? If you look back at your life and every painful item had been removed, every problem had been taken out of your life, every act of evil had been removed from your life, where do you think you would be? I'm not saying that you should be masochist and that you should ask God to give you pain. That's the definition of crazy. I'm not saying that we should long to hurt. But there is not one committed believer that I know that is not thankful for some of the pain in their life. That is not thankful for some of the suffering in their life. That some of the things that you thought were the curses that had been placed on your life, you've now had enough time to look back on it. And there have been some of you who at some point have bowed your knee and thanked God for the things that at one point in your life you were cursing Him for. And the reason is, is because even though it was heinous, and even though it was hurtful, and even though it was painful, God in His sovereign providence wanted to do something in you that He could have never, have been, never been done if He had just allowed you to be a spoiled brat. If God would have always just given you every whim and never allowed you to hurt, never allowed you to have pain, there are some of you that would have never repented of your sin. There are some of you that would have never thanked Him for his, your place in His life. There are some of you that it would never have been desperate for God. But because of pain, and we're going to talk about this even more next week, it's created a heavenly longing for God inside your soul in which you could be sanctified in a way that you could never love God like you do right now because you recognize. Now what's interesting is, the question of the problem of evil, that is mostly asked in Western environments. A lot of times it's asked from people in posh apartments that are living in university settings. Do you know where it's not being asked? In third world countries. That's interesting to me. The places where people are the definition of suffering, where drought and famine and all of those things are hurting, are hurting them. They aren't the ones that are predominantly pointing to the problem of evil. Those are the people that in their pain are saying that God has allowed this to happen so that we would trust Him more. Have any of you in here, we sang this morning, is anybody out there who could say amen when I say look back at your life and say thank God for the pain, thank God for the suffering, thank God for what he's brought me through. I love him more now than I did before. I trust him more now than I did before. Friends, you are a walking testimony to the fact that if it weren't for pain and suffering in your life, there could be no growth and sanctification in your life. So it may very well be that God allows things in your life that you would never want and that you would never wish for because in his loving kindness in his forbearance in his patience he wants more out of you than you could possibly imagine and he wants to grow you evil pain suffering they are wedges they are wedges that either drive us to Almighty God, or they will draw us away from God. So, I want us to conclude today with a very simple question. The pain in your life and the evil that you witness, is it drawing you closer to God? Or is it pushing you further away?